Hi, my name is Anthony Jennings. I am a lifelong resident of Minneapolis, North Sider NFL for life. I am here interviewing Crystal Porter, who is running for City Council Ward 5. How are you doing today? I'm doing fabulous. How are you doing? Yeah, it's a beautiful day outside besides the rain, but uh, I'm doing great. Yeah, I mean, you know, the rain's good. We needed some. We do, we do need the rain. <laughs> it's been dry, so. So what has your experience been like running in this upcoming election? It's been interesting. It's been a learning experience, but it, it's been, um, you know, as I've been kind of going throughout the community and knocking on doors, I've noticed that, you know, all the work that I've done over the many years that I've lived in North Minneapolis um, really was being picked up by the community. I didn't, you know, I, I spent years with my head down, just grinding and getting the work done and doing what I felt was right. And, um, and I swear, like, probably every three doors I knock on, people know me already yeah. and, and um, appreciate some of the work that I've done. So uh, it's, it's been nice, but it's also been kind of humbling as well. You know, we've lived in a in community, and you know this, yeah. being a lifelong Northsider. Um, you know, you get people that, that jump in races yeah. um, and, you know, for whatever reason, but... In North Minneapolis, we have a high turnover rate yeah. when it comes to city council. And I think a lot of it has to do with um, very low turnout rate. You know, we have the, less, uh, the least amount of people that show up to vote very true. Um, in the entire city. And, and because of that, I think some folks that, you know, are looking for an opportunity to get into a career of politics um, can go, oh, you know, that might be an easier place yeah. to, to start. So... Uh, we got seven people running right now yeah. in the in Ward Five, and and so um, we'll see what happens. So, being a, a North Side resident, um, for myself, I, I have interest in three things in my city council person, and the first we're going to talk about. I want to bring up is policing. Mm. What is your stance on where we're at policing, and where do you, if you win, where do you want to go mm. in that aspect? So I, it's really interesting because I was talking about that with my team yesterday. And um, I, want, I have a couple campaign chairs. Um, one of them I, I will not mention. <laughs> you probably know him if I mention him. But probably. He doesn't like his name being waved <laughs> around. But he said, you know what's really interesting, Christelle? He said, I know that you are somebody who is big on massive reform. He's like, I know this. And he's like, but I also know you and I've known you for years and he's like I know that you definitely um, understand and even agree with the people in the defund camp because of what you've been through and I'm and I'm like God, you know you're so right you know <laughs> I'm, I'm one of them people that are like I have a, I have a lot of common sense and um, common sense ain't always common. <laughs> yes I have a lot of common sense and I'm also somebody who is very strategic and um, I like to break things down and see how things, um, how certain pieces are affecting other pieces and how things work and flow. And, um, you know, <laughs> you're, you're in North Minneapolis, you know, um, we've dealt with a, a huge spike in crime. Yeah. Um, people are, are getting killed every single day. Yeah. Um, I, not that long ago, there was a shooting on my block and like seven boys ran through my yard with guns in their hands yeah. and right in front of me while I'm doing, you know, yard work. Yeah. And um, even my window, I just had to get it replaced yesterday. I got wow. shot out. Um, yeah, your block is hot. <laughs> You know, but I also, you know, it's a little, it's a little oasis too. Everybody yeah. knows each other too. Yep. So we know if it's happening, it's probably coming from outside the, you know, outside the community, you know, area, yeah. <laughs> I say community, but also the area, yeah, the direct area. blocks right there, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I do believe that we, we need police for sure. Um, how we're going to fix the situation that we're in, it's going to take some real work. Yeah. Um, we need massive reform. People have been asking for this forever, even before the, the union, uh, the, oh, yeah. the, the Minneapolis Police Union contract was signed in 1972. Mm -hmm. People have been asking for reform in the, of the police department for a very long time. Um, and has anyone ever taken it seriously? No. And then people keep saying, oh, well, reform is not going to work. We tried it before. 
No, we've never tried to reform. <laughs> we've never tried to reform. I mean, we talked about it. It's just, it's, what is the city of New Jersey that's done it? It's been over for 10, they've done it without police for 10 years now. I can't think of the name of it, but mm. it's the city of New Jersey who reformed mm -hmm. their thing 10 years ago. Yeah, and reform doesn't necessarily mean um, we're going to just continue, uh, we're just going to make some adjustments, you yeah. know, add some pretty flowers, uh, arrangements <laughs> around a, a crumbling foundation. Yeah. Reform can mean a complete overhaul. Yeah. Okay, but... You know, it's 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 all how you look at it and what your approach is. But I think that we definitely need to make sure that we are, when we're talking about police, who are we talking about? Are we talking about just filling these positions quickly because we're in the middle of crime and just be reactive? Yeah. Or does it mean let's be intentional and make sure that we're seeking out people that live in our community, know what it's like to be a North Sider, uh, looks like uh, someone we can relate to that has a vested interest in the community. See, I remember back coming here in the 80s and in early 90s, police used to walk the beat in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Like, and that, what you said about people coming from the neighborhood, when you, I always had this thing, if you live in the neighborhood, you know Lil John, John and Lil My Man ain't doing nothing crazy. Yeah. Because you've known them. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So we've gotten away from that, and I, I definitely think that's very important. Yeah, you know, um, you know, it, it is. It's it's important because you know if you know the the situation that you're coming into, you know you've got you, you're coming into a domestic situation. Yeah. You know, but you know that Fred drinks. Yeah. You know he has a drinking problem, mm -hmm. and you know that his wife Shirley tends to tends to cheat on him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you, you show up as an officer in that situation, you're going to be like, oh, okay, yeah, I know let's what's talk going this on down. with them. Yeah. You know, let's, let's talk it down. Let's get them, you know. As opposed to coming in hands on guns and everybody's messed up. Exactly. So we were talking about policing and, and people in the community knowing the police. Um, what is the hallmark of your, of your talk about reform? What is like the number one thing? for you when we talk about reform? Mm. So, you know, I had actually interviewed with, uh, you know, Tucson months ago, and we were talking about, like, the new contract that was being um, negotiated yeah. between the chief and uh, the union and the city um, council. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've had time to sit and think about this, and one of the main things that I really liked was the, the issue of arbitration and not allowing officers to go through arbitration after like, you know, being abusive towards a, a yeah. citizen or lying on a police report. But then I also thought about, um, we've been kicking around the idea of liability insurance for a very long, long time, time, right? I mean, wouldn't that be a quick way to just avoid the whole issue in the first place? Sure would. You know, <laughs> if, if officers in the, on the Minneapolis Police Department had to carry insurance, um, you know, if they do something that they're not supposed to do and their insurance goes up to where it's just like, whoa, this is too much money coming out of my paycheck, yeah. um, I should probably not do that again. Yeah, I think they would think twice. You know, and then and then the second time, if they do it again, well, you're not on, you're you're just not insurable. Yeah. And then if you're not insurable, then you just can't be an officer in the city of Minneapolis anymore. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that, I mean, I, I remember a gentleman had brought this up to my attention in, uh, I was at North High School and I was speaking at an Polars. event. Polars. Yeah. I was speaking at an event. It was so long ago. It was yeah. like maybe 10, 15 years ago. It was mm -hmm. a while back. And when he said it to me, I was like, huh. And, you know, I you know, kind of jotted that down in my, in my memory bank. and. Yeah. You know, and I've been in discussions with people through over the past decade about liability insurance, and people have been saying this would be a common sense approach. Yeah, it'd be common. It'd be so common sense, and and it would just you know totally um, bypass the issue of of you know officers that you know, are covered by um, union protection yep. that go through the arbitration process. Mm -hmm. Well, on the Minneapolis Police Department contract saying, you know, you have to be covered by yeah. liability insurance. And if you can't get it, you can't be an officer here. I definitely think all those excessive policing tactics would drop. Yeah. Tremendously. I really do. So let's segue. You, you mentioned North High. I want to segue into schools and education. What is your blueprint for better schools and better education in the city of Minneapolis? Mm. Well, in the, in the ward. <laughs> well... You know, I, I'm not running for school board. Um, um, I definitely have connections with people on the school board and respect a lot of the folks that are there and the folks that are running. Um, 
You know, but one thing that I always thought, because I've been working for Minneapolis Public Schools for seven years. Um, I'm currently a coach. Nice. Um, and I've had, I know every director of every park in North Minneapolis, of the rec centers, and I've coached mm -hmm. in the parks. And I thought about it, I was like, you know, I used to be a special education assistant. And I remember when the summertime would, would we'd be inching close to the summertime and we wanted to get jobs, you know, for the summer. It was usually only like three or four week window at yeah. the most where you could, you know, get employed during that time and yep. get through the summer. I was a painter doing that through North High. Yes. So yes. So you could bid on jobs, yep. right? And so you you go on there, you bid on a job, and half the time you don't get something, half the time you do, depending on your tenure. Yep. Depending on how long you've been there. Um, and I always thought it would be really cool if um, teachers and education assistants could bid on park jobs. Yeah. Um, in the summertime, you know, there's only there's only about fifty percent. Um, jobs available for the for the staff that work during the school year what would it look like if you know we've got how many parks in north minneapolis we only have a few rec centers mm -hmm. but how many parks are there's plenty pl plenty yeah. of parks where there's children playing all the time but no adults supervision yeah there's nobody there to to make sure they're okay to have a conversation build a relationship with them make sure they can pick up the lunches off the minneapolis public school food truck yeah um and hold them until kids show up um, and so I, I honestly think that there, there needs to be a more um, direct relationship between the parks and the schools because when the schools are out, the parks are in. Yeah. Um, and so then they could bid on these jobs. And now what would it look like if you're a kid, a group of kids that are going into a park and you go, oh, there's, you know, Mr. Robinson, yeah. you know, there's, you know, I know them. They work in the lunchroom at my school, and we already have built that relationship. I already look at them as, as an adult mm -hmm. that I can look up to, it's a trust. mentor. And um, they, there they are, someone to talk to, someone to spend time with, someone to grab a meal from, someone to you know take care of my, my, my cut on my knee if I fell yep. in the park. Um, and so I think that would be a good, um, a good model. And I also think that you know, there is a lot of people say there's not much for youth to do, but I, I really, I push back on that. Yeah. Um, we've got amazing programs. Every church There's on the north program. side is offering something. Yeah. Um, you know, you got the Loppet Foundation, which is a very white organization, but they have, through the, the, uh, the work that different folks in North Minneapolis have done to push them to, to make sure that they focus on, um, on the black community, they have created the North Kids pro pro Project, yep. and kids can get mountain biking, canoeing, um, cross-country skiing for free if they live in North Minneapolis. Oh, dope. Stuff that they're not exposed to. Exactly. That's awesome. They also, we also have Hopewell Music Cooperative, where your kids can get music lessons, any instrument they want to play so for why, free. So why aren't some of these things known about? Well, that's the issue. It's like, it, it, you got these nonprofits that are working on scraps, you know? I mean, you, they, they, they spend so much time raising money to be yeah. able to have the program in the first place that they don't have money to market it. You know, how much does it cost to put an ad in a newspaper, a yeah. local newspaper, let alone, a, you yeah. know, a, a newspaper that's across the city. Yeah. Um, it's hard to, you gotta pay the, the radio stations to get any information on there. And so they're working on, they don't have the capacity to be able to do the marketing to get people to know that it's even available in the first place. They should use social media influencers. That's true, but also I look at this and I say, what would it look like if all of these groups that are providing programming and opportunities for youth started to work together? Bridging then they could gap. get the word out, word out together. Yeah. What if the, we had a youth activity and programs fair twice a year? Yeah. You know, going into the summer, going into the fall, where everyone could go and they could find out what's available yeah. for their kids. It um, does take that that thinking outside the box to mm -hmm. to open up the dialogue and to the people know because like I didn't know about those last two the Hope and the Lot I didn't know about those. Yeah, there's all kinds and there's and there's more. It's just you know the Redeemer Lutheran Church does a solar class. Oh, I know class. Redeemer. Yeah, yeah, they do I solar in, engagement. You know. Yeah, I lived in their property for about five years. Oh yeah. Their property, so, so yeah, so I mean, and there's, it, and if people can't make it to the fair. Just like community education mm -hmm. flyer that uh, the that magazine you get, yep. have have something that goes out to every door yep. saying these are the things that are available to your kids at what month, during what times, yep. on, on what days, so that way that single father or single mother doesn't have to call five, ten, twenty different places to figure out a, a place yep. for their kid to be on Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday yep. throughout the summer. Yeah. All right, and I have one more topic that is dear and dear to my heart, and is toxic 
the toxic metals and all those things around North Minneapolis, specifically on the, the river right there. Mm -hmm. What is uh, one of the things you want to do to remedy that and to to be better about how people use the north side as a dumping ground? <laughs> You're probably going to get in trouble with this in the future, which is fine, because I'm, I'm an environmentalist, you know, and North Minneapolis has been a dumping ground oh, for yeah. a very long I know. time. <laughs> you know? I mean, the fact that we don't even have access to Bassett Creek is disgusting. You know, they buried it underneath North Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And the, where you finally can get access to it is outside of a brewery. Oh, know? Utapils, right there. Utapils, right? Yeah. And that's when you can see Bassett Creek. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's it goes to the underneath goes the, to park, the park. <laughs> and then it's completely polluted. Yeah. You know. Um, I... I really am upset because you go back and the way that the city has chose to develop the city, um, you know, they chose to make sure that all of these factories that are very toxic were built along the riverbed on our side. Mm -hmm. Not the northeast side. Yeah. <laughs> northeast, you can look right across yeah. and see people living right on the river. Mm -hmm. They got houseboats. Oh, I know. <laughs> Like I say, long time. And they got bars with like nice little decks over there they can you know enjoy. Um, and we got Broadway pizza. We got Broadway <laughs> pizza, you know. We do, on but it's hill. not on the river either. No, it's you not on the river. The street it's not on and the then river. go down a hill. And I work at Prize river. right there, Prize uh, Brewing, so we're right, we're right there. But yeah, still not I like on Prize. The river. Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> hey, they've, they've they've donated a lot to different initiatives that okay. we've done. So, so they, they got, they've been really very supportive of the North Side. You know, I. I really am upset because we have, you know, people keep talking about Northern Metals. We have five yeah. metal recycling facilities mm -hmm. in North Minneapolis, not just one, it's yeah. five. Um, and, you know, the people say, oh, it's really not that bad when we, when we go and test the soil. And I'm like, what do you consider not that bad? <laughs> you know? And where are you testing the soil? Just right there? Yeah. Um, the wind blows, okay? And also, it takes time for the soil to change mm -hmm. from toxins, mm -hmm. for the toxins to change the soil. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, the, 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 along the river, it's been stripped for so long that I've, I went over there last year and planted like three, 400 trees on, on the river. And the soil is so stripped from the nutrients um, that should be there that it's literally like just sand, you know, it just runs through your fingers and it shouldn't be like that at all. Um, you know, what, what needs to be done is the city needs to be a little more proactive um, when it comes to shutting some of the stuff down. Um, you cannot over-concentrate a community um, with um, pollutants and then expect that community to be a thriving community mm -hmm. uh, decades later. Yeah. Uh, you just can't. Um, there is a reason why we have the highest concentration of lead okay. in our children um, than anywhere else in the state, and it's because we've been surrounded by five metal recycling facilities. And not just that, also uh, two um, asphalt roof shingle factories as well, which is basically like standing next to a street that is pouring tar on the street every day your entire life. Um, so, you know, that's something that, um, that needs to change. And there's one thing that I, and I'd love to take you over there actually. Uh, if, if you would, if, you know, even today, you said yeah. you got all the time in the world, let's go down there after oh, this. Um, so there's a, a, a place along the river and um, a woman named Penelope, she started a North Rowing um, program and they got a huge grant, federal grant, and they put a, a, a space there where you can, you know, get in the water with your canoe dock, and canoe. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and it's crazy because it's got this little tiny strip and right next to it is GAF and the other side is you know a metal you know facility and it's just this little strip and you can park your car and you can grab a canoe and you can get in the water and the smell and I'm so glad it's there because the smell is overwhelming it is so bad um, because you're right by GAF yeah. right it's what does GAF stand for people who don't know? It's a, well, it's a, I don't even freaking know. Okay. I, it's a, it's a roofing company. They've Got been it. there forever. Got it. Um, and so this, this lot right here, it's a massive lot and it's actually the city's. Hmm. This is the city's lot that the city is leasing out oh, wow. to this roof shingle factory. And then there's the factory. 
So you got this massive piece of land that they, that we're leasing out as a city to this place that is polluting our community and the people in our community. And this has been going on for a very long time. You know, so what I would like to do is cancel that lease at least. Yeah. Uh, they use that to store the the things that they need in order to do the work that they need to do. So if we slowly um, choke them out, I think that would be good. I agree. Um, <laughs> they choking us out. Because <laughs> they are choking us out. You know, and, and, and the reality is like, like I said, you know, I don't think that things like this should be allowed to operate within at least a one square mile of any residential home. Yeah. And if that is the case, then they should not be in the city of Minneapolis. It just sucks that corporations are people. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what that sounds like. <laughs> yeah. that, that corporation is a person and they have yeah. the right to lease our lot. Yeah. You know, and, you know, a lot of people don't know that. Um, I mean, just take a walk along the river on the north side. Um, you yeah, can I choose still see. not to. I haven't walked the river over there in so long because it's gross. Yeah, I do all the time, probably because I'm, you know, I'm a dirty hippie. You Nothing know, that's what that. people call me. Ah. Um, but you know, it, it's good to to go into these spaces and see, yeah. um, because we need to know. Very you true. got so many people that are talking about it, yeah, but they don't really know. Yeah, you it's, know, it's one thing to talk about. It's one thing to visibly see. It. There's so many environmentalists yeah. that are talking about environmental justice for the north side oh, yeah, but have roxanne. never actually taken that walk yeah, my girl roxanne goes you know yes. roxanne. oh she roxanne's taking yeah. the walk jd and, you know jd yep yeah they they're both like yep. super, super yep super they're dope. amazing and and you know what and they have taken that walk but yeah, how many people have not actually gone down there and seen how disgusting it is and you still can see remnants of the rubble that was dumped there after it, like after uh, the Plymouth Avenue burned down yep. when they took the rubble of the buildings and dumped it along yeah. the river. I mean, this it's like, it's been, you know, it's it's disgusting. Yeah. But you know, and that's, that's one of the things that I would say, we need to remediate the river. And I am really, um, with what's going on with the Upper Harbor Terminal Project, yeah. um, currently, you know, the phase one and two is not really in my ward, but yeah. it still doesn't matter. This is my community. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a North Sider, whether it's the fourth or the fifth. Yeah. Um, and I, <laughs> black people have been cut off from water. Yeah. We have been yeah. cut off from the river. From good water. Okay. <laughs> you know, and anywhere else in the city, you are not allowed to live on bodies of water. Yeah. It is public land. Yeah. Um, so we need to open up that space all along the river and open it up to the entire community. And you need to allow the community to lead um, the plans on what goes there. And when I say community, I say black and indig indigenous yeah. folks, because um, that was actually a very sacred space for native people. Um, you know, the fact that they, you know, dismantled Spirit Island uh -huh. um, and took that limestone and, and built our, our government foundation of the buildings off of that, that um, island, which was I sacred. Didn't know that. Wow. It was um, was was wrong, yeah. and you know you're going if whatever they're planning at the Upper Harbor Terminal, they need to make sure that blacks and natives are at the table and are getting what they want um, in that plan. You know whatever you know industry or you know corporate plans you have on that area. They first and sand. foremost, we need stake on that land because we've been robbed from it for so long. I agree, and I thank you for allowing us to have this time to talk in the chat. Almost like a fireside chat without FDR. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, anytime. I love talking to you. Oh, man, Do listen. you want to go down there, though, seriously? Um, yeah. OK, yeah. let's do it. We can do it right after. Get some ice cream and then go down. <laughs> ice cream, we'll go right by ice yeah. cream, so let's do that.